and worship the Lord. Amen. He is so worthy. He is so worthy. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive, all my failures I try to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You called my name.
respond this morning to a total surrender with Him. The Lord is calling us to full surrender. Respond this morning. Respond this morning. You see how you 
that sometimes it's hard to step out. Where do we feel this and just meditate on him this morning? be amazed how faithful he is. He loves you and me today and we just celebrate him this morning, his faithfulness and his love toward us. Father, we lift you up in this place. We just continue to worship you, God, and we're, we're excited about being here this morning and we're excited you're here with us, God, and we celebrate you. You are so good to us. More than I deserve, God. More than I deserve. But God, we just continue to lift you up in this place and praise you. We pray, God, that you will bless the church as they uh, bring the tithe this morning and the alms and the offerings. So much promise, God. There's so much promise when we obey you. So much promise that you have for us, God. Help us to just yield and obey you and worship you in our giving. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. Just a couple of announcements. If you have not taken, been a part of, Every Man a Warrior, our Cultivating Holy Beauties, book one, we will be starting new groups the 15th of August. Sign-up sheets are in the foyer for you to sign up on. You may have went through book one, but if you did not complete book one, you need to redo that. It's important for us to complete what we start, amen? amen. So, or if you've been through it and you just want to refresh yourself, that's fine as well. And uh, we're registering for Impact School of Ministry right now. If you would like to be a part of that, please Look at the foyer. There's applications, things there for you. The office can help you. Heather, the administrator, can help you with what you need to do. And uh, be a part. Those classes start the 15th. August the 8th, we will begin a new year with Impact's Christian Academy. We're at around 42 registrations right now, <laughs> believing for 50 yeah. and more. Yeah. So that means you need to talk it up, speak it out, let people know that uh, what we have going on. Word of mouth is one of the greatest advertisements. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So good to have everyone here today. This is a time when we stand up and we go around and we meet and greet. We high five, we fist bump, we hug somebody. We let everyone know we're glad that you're here. Introduce yourself to somebody if you do not know them. All right?
everybody There's something that you need to see Hey guys, it's Rachel here at Bethesda House of Mercy and I'm calling all the top chefs ages 3 to 11 to meet me right here at 2738 Ring Road in Elizabethtown, Kentucky as we get ready for a food truck party. This is going to be every night starting tomorrow night, the 16th, and it's going to be from 6 to 8.30 and we will run till Thursday the 20th. So get all your stuff together, grab your friends and meet us right here at Bethesda House of Mercy. So we thank God for our food, for by God's hand, we are fed, give us for our daily bread. So what's up, what's up? food truck, <laughs> what we learn about, <laughs> Jesus, we're on the road, and we're never gonna stop, cause we're living, yeah, we're living on the word of God, we're living, yeah, we're living on the word of God. When you see it rolling into your neighborhood, come taste and see.
had an awesome week at VBS. It really was a great time. We got to minister to 45 kids and their families, so that was really great. So at this time, if you helped in any way with uh, Adventure Camp, we would like for you to stand right now. We want to recognize you and all your hard work. Let's give it up. Chris and I, I want to thank you guys for all that you did because without you guys, we cannot do that. It takes a whole village to put that on. So thank you again for all that. Um, we want to invite you this afternoon, right after service, we are having our um, fundraiser lunch, and it is donations only. This helps to provide stuff for the VBS, for our curriculums. It helps us to be able to do things with the kids throughout the summers, throughout the winter times. So like I said, stay after. There is plenty of food. We're having a taco bar, and just come fellowship with us. Thank you, guys. Let's give the Lord the ha a hand for all that. The Lord is blessing. How many of you believe the Lord's up to something? I believe God's up to something. But the thing about it is, God doesn't want it to be a secret from us. A lot of times we walk around as though we have no clue of what God's up to. But God doesn't want it to be a secret. God wants it to be something that we are aware of. How are we going to be aware of what God is up to? It's going to come through an intimate relationship with Christ. We know that through the governor, through the director, through the one who he has given to us, who is the Holy Spirit, you and I have revelation and understanding of God's plan. So that nothing that takes place takes us by surprise. Do you know that even when the last trumpet sounds, it shouldn't take God's children by surprise? We should be aware that that's getting ready to happen because we are aware of the times that we live in. We are aware of what's taking place around us. And we can see from the scripture, the book, that that we have for our revelation and understanding, we can see what those signs are and what we are looking at and what we are seeing. So that we are not taken unaware. Right? We're not asleep, he says, as other Gentiles are asleep. We're awake. We observe. We watch. We see. And we understand because we are children of the word. That's what we are to be, right? Not, not children of some philosophy or not children of some denominational doctrine. But we are children of God who are alive in the spirit who should be feasting on the food truck. Talk about the food truck. Your word, O oh Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word, O oh Lord, is manna from heaven. That we sit at the banqueting table of the Lord, and the Lord says, come and dine. Aren't you glad for that? Praise the Lord. We're talking about the kingdom of God. Trying to get ourselves back to 
kingdom principles and kingdom life. It's kind of ironic that we have to say that in the church. But we all recognize, don't we, that when you look at the New Testament and the church that's functioning there and operating, and then you look at the church today, we can see a huge gap. We can see a huge difference between what took place in the new covenant order of the New Testament church versus what's taking place today. And I think we can see things that are different in what's taking place today, not just because of technology. How many of you know the technology is different today than it was back in the first century church? Amen? You, you, you come in here today and you first got here and it's this bright. Isn't it bright in here? But if you came in late, like for some reason people do, you came in and it was darker. And we had lights here and a big screen. And we worship. We have electronic musicians and instruments and not musicians, but instruments. We might, we might have had a few electronic musicians back here in the background. We don't know. Uh, AI is on its way. <laughs> I tell you what, I would take a robot electric guitar player right now if he was good. But we have all these electronics. You go back in that booth and there's somebody sitting over here that operates the soundboard. And there's somebody in the middle that operates cameras for our live service. And there's somebody over here who operates the words on the screen. It's all ran by electronics and computers and things of that nature. And then there's microphones up here that magnify somebody's voice. There's, there's this thing wrapped around my head today that um, helps to uh, magnify my voice for something yet only for the live because I don't need it. So we can see all these electronics. We, we don't walk to church or we don't ride a horse or camel or donkey. We, we drive our automobiles and We see all kinds of differences between the New Testament first century church than we do today, don't we? But those are not the things that I think have damaged us, hurt us, or hindered us. I believe what has damaged us or hindered us is that we have moved away from the divine order that God has established for us on this earth. So much so that when somebody talks about divine order, we get confused. We may not see it clear. We live in our traditions, our, our understandings, our, our swaying from the truth. How many of you know... How many of you know we've swayed from the truth? Almost unto a different gospel. We've talked about that. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said, don't let an angel or any of us come to you and preach any other gospel than what we have declared to you. And if they do, let them be accursed. That's pretty serious, isn't it? So what should we do? We should stick with the book. We're not looking for a new fad, or we're not looking for a new way in order to get God's word across. That's what we went through for decades. We had to find a new way. You just couldn't tell people the way you used to tell them. No, we, we tried to find a new way in which we could tell the gospel, so we changed it up a little bit with some compromise thrown in. But that's not what the Lord's after. What we need today is the same thing they had in the first century church 
which was the power of God unto salvation. The power of God. The Holy Spirit. Isn't that what ignited the early church? Jesus said that he was full of the Spirit. He came and he came to preach that gospel to do what? To set the captives free. To unlock the prison door. To help people to escape their reality of life. To place them into a new kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he says this, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Did you notice that? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I, I think that should eliminate anybody wondering who Jesus was. Right? How many of you know Jesus was God in the flesh? He came and dwelt among us. Not to show us something different, but to show us what should be happening, an activity that should be taking place in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, he says, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Why didn't he just say in the name of Jesus right there? Because he came here, he said, not to testify of himself. But yet he did declare to us that when you go and make disciples and when you baptize, baptize in the name that represents the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And what is that? Jesus teaching these disciples to observe all things that I have commanded you and lo. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Even to the end of the age. Go to the next slide, please, real quick. And the next. Thank you. Here we have what we call a, a view of what is above where Jesus said, I have all authority in heaven. And we get a view of this above this line here that you can barely see. Um, but you see a view of heaven. And what do you see? You see the Father and the Son. And you see the Holy Spirit. And we understand, don't we, that the Bible says that Jesus, when he left here, when he ascended back into heaven... The Bible says he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And there he does what? He makes intercession for you and I. Oh, man, aren't you thrilled with that? Now I'll tell you what, Jesus, listen to me, listen to me. Jesus is praying for you. <laughs> I, I'm thankful that I, I think maybe all of y'all pray for me. I think all of y'all pray for the elders. But I'm going to tell you what, I'm more thrilled about today than the fact that all of you pray for us is Jesus is praying for us. He sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us when the accuser of the brethren, anybody in here know who the accuser of the brethren is? Who is he? He is the devil. Lucifer, not just the enemy. Hey, listen, we got enemies in this place today. Did you hear me? Not physical. You're not my enemy. Not physical enemies, but how many of you know there are enemies on assignment to fight you, to deter you, and to get you, if possible, to have your mind on everything that it possibly can be on instead of what it needs to be on. The enemy. Spirits. How many of you know we don't fight flesh and blood? But principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness 
of the air. We are in a fight against spiritual wickedness, evil. But, but the enemy, Lucifer, the devil, is the accuser of the brethren. And he comes to this throne room because he still has access to it yet. He comes to this throne room and he accuses you before the Lord. He did Job, didn't he? Sons of God met. Bible says that Job, that, that the sons of God met. Satan was present. And what did he do? He comes and he accuses God with Job. Did you, did you uh, ever think about my servant Job? Yeah, yeah, well, the only reason he serves you is because you've got a hedge built around. He accuses Job's faith. He accuses Job's dedication. He accuses Job's commitment to God of not being genuine because God, the only reason he does it is because you've got a hedge built around him. He's the accuser of the brethren. He comes before God to accuse you of things. And in that midst of that accusing, Jesus steps in and Jesus prays. But Jesus says, wait a minute, I washed him in my blood, and you need to be quiet. Accuser of the brethren. This fight of faith that you and I have, that all goes on. That's all happening still. There will be a day when the accuser of the brethren will be cast down and will not be able to. But I want to tell you that day's not happening. But that all happens above that heaven and earth line where you see the Holy Spirit. There's a line going through there. Because you see, it, even though that's going on up there, we know things are happening here as well. But the Holy Spirit, He is not just in heaven and glory. He's also here. Jesus said, I'm going to go away. Man, it's important. Stop your walling around in your self-pity about me leaving here. I'm going to go away because it's so important that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Father will not send you the comforter. But if I go away, I'm going to pray. And he's going to send you a comforter who won't be just with you. He will be in you. You're not going to be governmentless. Did you hear me? I'm going to send the governor to your house. <laughs> I'm going to send Holy Spirit to your house. Huh? Get ready. Holy Spirit's coming to your house. You know, I don't live on chill bumps, but I like it when I feel them. I don't live on the oozing, but man, I like it when I feel it. Yeah. Only thing that makes me nervous is it was 1130 when I started. <laughs> I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to your house. Go and expect him to come. And when he comes, he's going to testify of me. But listen. Here's another thing that we kind of lose sight of, and that is when he comes, he wants to take over. He's not, he's not wanting to come just as a little uh, booster shot. We had this vaccine go out, and then, you know, that vaccine wasn't enough. You got to have a booster, then a booster, booster, then a booster, 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 booster. Until they boosted you almost out of life. Uh -huh. Holy Spirit is not just a booster. He wants to come and take control. He wants to come as a governor to govern. He wants to govern. See, that's the problem in here right now. Too many of us 
We still want to be the governor. We still want to govern. We want to be in control. We want to do what we want to do when we want to do it. But if you're really going to let the governor be in control, he got to surrender your rulership over your life and understand you don't belong to yourself anymore. You were bought with a price. He owns you. He wants to govern you. Why? Because God's got an order. It's not about value. It's about order. It's not about equity or equality. It's about order. And I want to tell you something. God's order don't always make sense to me. God's order apparently doesn't always make sense to the church. Because when we in conflict with God's order, we tend to change it a little bit. And we'll find some obscure scripture somewhere, or we'll find somebody's interpretation of a scripture somewhere, or we'll find something that's popular with what the world says, and we'll tweak what we believe the order is. In order to satisfy people's whims. Come on. It's what we do. But what we got to get back to is understanding this. It doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> Woo! Pastor Jerry, you're just so mean. I I'm sorry, I just can't help myself. But it really doesn't matter what I think. It really doesn't. It doesn't matter. I can go to God and I can ask God a question. God, I just don't understand why you say in your word that even though I'm 63, there's times when I need to submit to some 26-year-old. You say, what? You heard me. You heard me. When I walk in here in the mornings, I'm an elder in this church. But I submit to the authority of those who are governing in areas in the church that I don't need to be messing with. Come on. Even though he's not been where I've been, done what I've done, I submit myself to whatever he has said. As an elder, I have the right to go to him afterwards and say, I think we ought to talk about this in the eldership and maybe do this different. But I submit myself to his authority at the moment. I don't always understand that kind of stuff. You, you sometimes have a problem because you have trouble submitting to the younger ones not, and not so much the older ones because they've not been around as long as you have. We don't like that. I'm old enough to be your grandpa. What do you mean, submit to you? Just put your religious spirit in your pocket. And just lift up Jesus and do what the word says. We don't always like the government of God. We don't like sometimes what God declares. So what do we do? We modify it and we try to change it. But I want you to know. God is sovereign. Exclamation point. God is in charge. All authority resides in him. He is the only true potentate. All other authority, no matter who it is, where it is, what it is, is delegated by God. Amen? Amen. We got a president of the United States of America that I'm going to just tell you right straight out up front. I probably don't agree with that much of what comes out of his mouth. Hello? Hello? But yet, Paul writes in Romans, speaking to the Romans about a more even wicked authority, Paul says, God ordains all authority. God puts in all authority. 
And your role, church, is to pray for those that God has put into authority. Not to sit around and running your mouth and trashing them all the time. You can ask a question. You can disagree. But what we should be doing is, God, in the name of Jesus, heal that man. Heal him. Save him. Because all authority, whether it be good, this is where we have a tr- this is where we fall out. Whether it be good or evil, has been ordained by God. Huh? Come on, am I telling you the book? Even hello, listen, let it sink in. Even Lucifer. Oh, Pastor Jerry. (laughs) Now, come on, brother. God did not create the devil. Yes, he did. And I want you to know, when Lucifer got prideful and for some ignorant reason thought he could take over God's spot, it did not take God by surprise. Hello, it did not take God by surprise. God knew it when he created him. Because everything that's done, whether it be good or evil, is done for the ultimate end, which is God's glory. So whether it's good or evil, God ordained it. He set it in order. He wants us to know there is an order. There is an order. In heaven, there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself represents the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In that trinity there, there is only one who has a body. Did you hear me? God is not some elderly figure on a throne with a long beard. He is a spirit. And in that trinity, it, he, it, it's made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which they then represent God himself. Jesus, though, has a body. We know this to be true. He was on the earth. He went back into heaven. And John the Revelator in Revelations on the Isle of Patmos had a dream, vision, whatever in the world you want to call it. And he was in the throne room. And he was upset because he did not see anyone. Now, this is kind of crazy, too, isn't it? He's in the throne room. Uh, There's the Father. Holy Spirit and the Father are there. But John says, I begin to weep. I didn't see anyone who was worthy to take the scroll from the hand of the one who sat on the throne. He said, I didn't see anybody worthy. He said, but wait a minute. I could hear the seraphims and the cherubims crying out, holy, holy, holy. There was a worship time going on. And then behold, I saw him The Son of God who came and was slain. He came over. He took the book. He opened it up. Because Jesus said, all authority. Come on. Not anyone else. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Oh, my goodness. You sound like you're Jesus only. How can you say that? I just said the Trinity is represented by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But yet Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's why the scripture says every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. He didn't say every knee will bow and every tongue will confess 
to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He said every knee will bow, every tongue will confess to Jesus Christ who is Lord. Who is above every name. Now listen, when they bow though to Jesus Christ and his power and authority, they are bowing to the Trinity. They are bowing to the submitting to the Father and the Holy Spirit. All power. Because there's an order. Did you hear me? 1 Corinthians 11.3, Jesus says this, or Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says this about Christ. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is man. And the head of Christ, here listen, is God. Woo, I didn't say that. He did. But you know what? We don't like that. We're living in modern times today, so we don't like that. Um, next slide, please. Next, there you go. We don't like it. Here's, here's basically what he says. How many of you believe that the church is under the umbrella on this earth? I'm going to get ahead of myself, but it's under the umbrella of the eldership. But there's another order that I didn't create. But God did. It's called the umbrella of authority. The very first umbrella we already have, I think, established. That first umbrella is Christ. But, but the scripture didn't stop there. He said, but the head of, Christ, head of the man is Christ. So the man is in the next flow in the natural authority on this earth, the man is in the next flow of authority under who? Christ. It's not, it's not the man and the woman side by side. <clears throat> it's the man, and then it says, what is the man to do? He's a protector. He's to lead the family. He's to provide for the family. Now, I'm reviewing what I preached several weeks ago, so you shouldn't be sitting here going, what? You should just already be a man because you already went home and proved it, that I'm telling you the truth. But since I took a few weeks off, and Pastor Doug waxed eloquently, so well eloquent that I got to come back now and review this, we ought to already know this is the truth. Some people say, well... If I had a husband, listen, if I had a husband that was like what you just said, I would submit. Well, well. <laughs> Under the husband, Jesus said you have the wife. What is the wife? Comfort, teach, and nurture. That motherly role of the wife in the home is irreplaceable. The husband can nurture as well. I nurture my kids, but sometimes I nurture them with a little slap in the back of the head. But I nurture them. I, I hug on them. I love on them. I, I talk to them about their issues as well as their mother does. But there's, there's a mother's nurturing that just doesn't hold to what a father does. In other words, her nurturing is way beyond and better. And my kids did not come to me when they hurt themselves first. They went to their mother because they knew that along with my nurturing, they were also going to get, why did you not listen? Where they knew when they went to their mother, she was going to say, oh, baby, honey, it's okay. It's really, it's all right. Let's get some alcohol on that. And let's get that off. And back it up. And then when she would go and say, oh, it's okay, honey. <laughs> Mommy loves you. I don't care that you disobeyed me. <laughs> it's bless your heart. <laughs> Fathers just usually, now there can be, usually don't kind of act like that. You know what I mean? 
father say, I just want you to know, we're going to get you doctored up, and then we're going to paddle your tail, and you're going to be grounded for a week. And the kids are going, well, why did I even come to you? I don't know. I can't figure that out either. You have, the, you have God. You have the husband. You have the wife. You have the children. Children's role is to love, love the parents and obey the parents. Parents, you have to realize, sometimes we talk about honor. Are my kids really honoring me? Well, sometimes the kids can only honor you so far because you're trying to take them in the wrong direction. But yet the kids will submit, they'll obey their parents, even sometimes when the parents aren't exactly right. But how many you believe that kids are to honor their parents and obey their parents when their parents tell them that they cannot uh, serve Jesus, or they cannot read their Bibles, or they cannot go to church, or they cannot do anything. There comes a time when we have to uh, look at that and say, wait a minute, how far can that go? There comes a time when kids get old enough that they're about to make decisions on their own. We have to give them that space. And parents, listen, God also speaks to us, don't bring your children to wrath. God has this natural divine order that we don't like. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a word right now that I'm going to tell you up front we don't like. And that is patriarchy. In the Bible, we have patriarchs. In God's system, we have a patriarchal system. That word patriarch is not a bad word. It's not nasty or filthy or, or something that we should shy away from. It's, it's God's order. The patriarch in the family were the males. Hello? And the males had their lineage all the way through. And, and so what happened, though, what happens with all this, even though we know this authority that God gave in this a picture that we have here, this order of what God says for the family, we know that that was be had began all the way in the book of Genesis. How many of you know that in the book of Genesis, that Adam was the head? Not because of the curse. How many of you know Adam was the head before the sin happened? How many of you know the male was made first? <laughs> we weren't the prettiest. And we weren't the nicest looking, but we were made first. We were made of dirt. We were made first. It was the male that was made first. And it was the male's responsibility to have authority over everything that was on the earth. Was it not? Not because of the curse of sin, but because that's the way God planned it. That was God's order. Right? Then God says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. All this was good, but man, boom, got to here. And I got this man, and I'm looking. Everything else has something, but this man doesn't. I'm going to make this man a help me. And I'm going to take this rib from man out of his side to where when, when she comes along, he can bring her up beside him and he can love her and care for her and protect her and watch out for her. Come on. And God creates this help meet for Adam. Adam was impressed because he said, whoa, man, that's awesome for me. You know she was gorgeous. You know he was, in, he was, he was Twitter paid it. For you younger people that don't know what Twitter paid it is, you need to watch Bambi. And you can learn what being Twitter paid it means. Husbands, I, I sure hope that we never lose being Twitter paid it with our spouse. 
when she walks in the room, it ought to do something for her. Hello? Men, hello? Yeah, okay. John, you should be speaking that louder than anybody else because I think you might be the newliest wed in here. <laughs> you, I, I mean, praise be to God, I hope, in the name of Jesus. How many months has it been? Three months, I pray to God. That you have not lost the woe <laughs> in just three months. So when I said what I said about when she walks in the room, John, you should have been the first person to rate man, the first man to raise your hand up and go, well, yeah. <laughs> and you're saying right now, thanks, Pastor Jerry. You, you know how Sylvia is, and I will be getting in trouble after this. I'm sorry, brother, but I'm just telling you what you should have done. I'm helping you. <clears throat> God has set this patriarchy, God has set this divine order in place for a reason. But what we're seeing today is... What we're seeing today is, on every front, this divine order is being attacked. There used to be a day when males were our heroes. Now it's politicians, or sports players, or, or somebody who's stepping out and defending transgenderism. Now it's all kinds of things, and... And, and no longer when you ask a kid, who's your hero, do they say, my father is. He's watched out for me, taken care of me. He's cherished me. He's watched over me. He's provided for me. He's tried to be there for me when I need it. And when I needed discipline, he was the one that told me the truth even when I didn't want to hear it. But the reason why male figures have lost their ability to be heroes is because they have been demasculated and they have been reduced to people that are just fools. Every program, every show that's made, every movie that comes out makes the husband, the male figure, look stupid. And let me tell you something, I'm not up here naive that men have their problems and issues. But I want you to know God's order is God's order. You don't have to like it, but you better walk in it or else you will have God's hand against you. You cannot be blessed. And, and so some people say, well, wait a minute. The reason why you're saying that is because you don't value women. You're a male chauvinist pig. <clears throat> I want you to know it's not about value. If, if anybody has sat and talked to me about my wife, you don't have to sit there for five minutes and talk to me that you don't hear how I value her. Her gifts, her talents, her abilities, her labors of love, how she serves, not just the church, but our family. It's not about value. It's about order. And so what do they say? Well, well, that was, under, that was under the curse of the law. In Genesis, God says, and I'm not going to take time to read it, but in Genesis 3, 9 through 20, he sits there and he talks about how the serpent came. And, and Eve says, the serpent seduced me. He caused me to do what I did. So God curses the serpent. But then he comes back. And he starts talking to the woman, and he said to the woman, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. We call that, hello, we call that the curse. Hello? Hello? 
That's what we say. And then we come along in the feminist movement in the church and we say, but yet that's not true anymore because we are not under the curse. How many of you know that before Eve and Adam took of the fruit and found themselves without God, how many of you know Adam was in charge? And what messed everything up was Adam was a coward and let the woe get too much in his way and stood back and watched the serpent beguile his wife. I want you to know, Sarita may feel like something is what she should do. She may feel like it's the greatest thing on the planet Earth. But when I see danger, 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 Will Wive Robinson, I'm going to tell her under no uncertain terms you're going to do that. You say, well, that's horrible. You shouldn't do that. I am in charge. It is my household. God told me he put me in charge. Why? Because when he created the woman, he created her as the weaker vessel to be protected and watched over. It doesn't mean that I'm smarter than her. It doesn't mean sometimes that I'm even stronger than her. I am. (laughs) Stronger. Not smarter. Stronger. But it, it means that I am to be the one that's responsible. The government is on me. The government is there that I have to walk in and I have to live for. I have to answer to. Well, Pastor Jerry, that all changed because we're not under the curse of the law. Hmm. Wow. Hold on a minute. So Adam's no longer, uh, no longer considered the head because he was only because of the curse. Now we no longer live that way because we're under Christ. We've been freed from the law. We've been freed from the curse. How many of you know that we're not free from the law? You don't walk around doing anything you want to do whenever you want to do it because you're free from the law. We're not under bondage to that legislative device of the law. We've been made free through the blood of Jesus Christ. But how many of you know I still shall not kill? Jesus comes. And here's what they want to say. They want to say this, they want to say, that's no longer applies because we're no longer in the curse. And the Bible says that we're all equal at the foot of the cross. He didn't make male, it's no longer male, nor female, nor Jew, nor Greek, but we're all just one at the cross. How many of you know that's a true statement? That as far as our salvation, God is no respecter of person. It doesn't make any difference whether you're male or female, whether you're red, yellow, black, green, or blue. We are the same in God's sight. doesn't matter what nationality you are. We all have access to the cross, to the, to the blood of Jesus Christ. So that's true. But that doesn't mean he changed the order. You say, well, he did. He, he did away with the curse of the law. Well, he also told Eve something else. He told her in there, he said, Eve, he said, in childbearing, you're going to have a lot of pain. How many women in here, without the use of any drugs, after you gave your heart to Jesus Christ and served him, went and had a baby and didn't have any pain? Yeah, thank you very much, Diane. I was going to say, man, we need to put you up here in some kind of trophy case. (laughs) Because I was with my wife with some drugs, and I was with my wife without any drugs. And I'm going to tell you, with some drugs, she still had pain. And without drugs, she had a lot. And so we have to say then, what's wrong with you women? Maybe you really then haven't given your life to Jesus because you're still under the curse of pain when you give birth. Does that mean it's true? Your desire is going to be under your husband. You're going to desire for him to take care of you. But because of what's transpired in this world, we no longer recognize that. Why? Because the whole goal is the destruction of God's order. It's the destruction of God's order. 
You see, because we want to say and do what we want to do. We want to be what we want to be. Ephesians 5.22 says this, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body of which he is Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to your husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. To make it holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word. And to present her to himself as radiant. We know Jesus is talking about his union with the church. But yet, we also understand he's given us a picture of the order again of what the home is to be like. And again, we say, sometimes I hear women say this, Pastor, if my husband, though, would be that, if he would do this, if he was a Christian, if he followed the word, if he didn't fail, if he didn't have any faults, if he didn't have any habits, if he wasn't addicted to anything, if he didn't have anything going on, I would submit myself to him. The problem with that is, Jesus says, for the woman to submit to her husband, even to those who don't honor the word. Why? Because that's God's order. Now, does she have to submit to physical abuse? Does she have to submit to his things that are telling her to do contrary to the word? No. But yet, Christ has given us an example He said to the husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. Before I sit around and try to point my finger at Sarita to find out if she's submitting or not, I have to go before the Lord and say, God, am I loving her the way you want me to? Am I loving her according to what you said in your word as Christ loved the church? Am I causing her to stumble, God? Am I causing her not to submit? Is it my fault that she's doing it? Now, that doesn't excuse her, but I'm to examine myself. Am I being the priest of my home? Am I being the prophet of my home? Am I dedicating myself to you, God? Am I praying for her, Lord? Well, if the answer is no to that, then the thing is, is that I need to correct what? Sarita? Huh? Huh? Should my first response be, i got to figure out how I'm going to get her in shape? Huh? No, I, I should be saying, brothers, I should have accountability people. Brothers, help me. I'm not doing what I should do according to what God's word says. I'm causing my wife to stumble. Help me to become everything I am to be. Help us, Jesus. To fall into what? Order. To fall into order. To to fall into your divine guidance. Amen? Amen. How many of you want to fall and get into God's order? You want to stop running around doing your own thing. I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. If you do not fall underneath God's order, I can with all confidence say you will not walk under the blessings of the Lord. If you do not walk under the authority that God has laid out, you can say what you want to, you can shout, speak in tongues, you can shake and rattle and roll. Huh? But as they said yesterday when they were preaching at the the convention yesterday, you need to check your Holy Spirit. Because will not the governor... If we're allowing him to be who he is, won't he keep us in the right flow, in the right way? And when we're not in that way, will he not convict us and tell us we need to repent? Huh? We won't walk around and say, well, like Eve did, God, that serpent, like Adam did, God, that woman, here we are today, God, that wife, God, that husband. Lord, I wouldn't be addicted to this if you wouldn't have given me that wife. Huh? No, you're addicted to it because you yourself won't flow in the order of God. You won't allow the Holy Spirit to govern your life. 
You're still wanting to be in control. There's deliverance for every person in this house today. There is deliverance by the power of God and to break every stronghold in your life. Holy Spirit is here to do what we are incapable of doing. God also has an order. It's spiritual order. Ephesians 4, 10 through 16, he says in the message, For the one who climbed down is the one who climbed back up, up to the highest heaven. He handed out gifts above and below, filled the earth with his gifts, filled the earth with his gifts. He handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor, teacher to train Christians. Did you hear me? How many of you know we're not looking to be involved in leadership development? We're we're here to be involved in Christian development, children development, saint development. And as we then train God's people, God then will bring some to some form of leadership. But he says, train Christians in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we are all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient, graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within, fully developed without, Fully alive like Christ. No prolonged infancies among us, please. We'll not tolerate babies in the woods and small children who are an easy mark for imposters. Why should we want every believer to be mature? So they don't get swallowed up. This week, my daughter and son-in-law and their two kids were with us. They have... They've, they've adopted one, one, they want to adopt this young, uh, the baby they have, Jeremiah. They're hoping that takes place, but it's still in that process. Reagan is old enough for them to say, go get you something out of the refrigerator. Go do this. Or, or you know, now she's getting to the age where she's actually becoming the reason that they even got her. She's actually becoming useful because now they can say to her, go get me a drink. Go get my slippers. Fix me a sandwich. Did you know that's the only reason they had you? (laughs) You, on the other hand, they had you because they wanted to. (laughs) Sorry. I joke with my boys and say, your mother, your, your sister was planned. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> but Jeremiah, on the other hand, guess what they won't do? They won't take him over and set him outside by himself. Hey, that's right. <laughs> they will not take him outside and set him by himself. Why? Because he can't do anything for himself. He has to cry when he's hungry. He has to cry when he's wet. He has to cry when he's ready to go to bed. He does not, he does not and is not able to do anything for himself. You wouldn't set him inside my chicken pen with some roosters and a bunch of hens because they would come and they would peck at him. They would look at him as a threat. But my, my uh, other granddaughter, Reagan, spent the, her whole week, which is why our egg production is down. She spent her whole week doing nothing but tormenting those hens. And as she would go in there, they would run from her. But it didn't matter to her that they ran. She just went in and got them. Jeremiah can't protect himself. We don't want you to remain an infant in the body of Christ while the enemy, the spirits that's out after you come and peck at you to death. 
and lead you astray. We don't want to leave you like infants so that some well-intentioned dragon can come along and lead you off in false doctrine. That's why I don't tell people not to listen to other things on the radio or internet or whatever, preaching. But you better be careful. God did not assign them over you. God didn't sign 7,465 pastors over you to watch out for you, to care for you, to teach you, to instruct you. Because you said God planted you here, God assigned these five elders to watch after you and teach you, instruct you, and guard you. Hello? Too many people in the church today, they listen to and believe and walk after everybody else but those who are over them in the Lord. They would take their counsel before they would ours. Hello? You better watch yourself. No more emphases. Infancies. We'll not tolerate babes in the woods and children who are an easy mark for imposters. God wants us to grow up. Everybody say grow up. Grow up. To know the whole truth and to tell it in love. Like Christ in everything, we take our lead from Christ who is who is the source of everything we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. Amen? Next week, I'm going to go a little bit further and talk about, again, this heaven and earth line. But I'm going to move on to the authority in the church. Because it's important that we get this right. Hello? Because it's about order, not about value. It's about order. It's about what does God say. Next week we're going to talk a little bit about what God says about the divine order in the, as in the spiritual governing on this earth. How many of you know there's, that God still operates naturally and spiritually? How many of you know that God created us from the very beginning to operate natural world, spiritual world? And even the natural, this flow in the home, even though it, we, call, we might say or use the word that's the natural flow for this natural life that we live, how many of you know it is spiritual? As well, because God says it's considering that with Christ and the church. Let's stand this morning. This morning, I want you to know that God is calling us to divine order. He is calling us to divine makeup. To follow after God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, even when... We don't understand. Even when we aren't real clear, I am to obey the book. God is so good. He loves us so much. But he wants us to flow in his divine order. He wants us to walk in his ways. That we are not to lean on our own understanding. Hello? Do not lean, he says, on your own understanding. But in all of your ways, acknowledge him. he cares for you and then he did you hear me when you submit yourself to divine order stop fighting God's order when you submit yourself to divine order it says then he will direct your path man I tell you what that's powerful isn't it if I submit myself in obedience to God to his word, 
He will direct my path. But a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You can't go your own way. You can't do your own thing. You can't figure out your own plan and scheme. Do you know that you cannot figure out your, you can't, you should not be trying to roadmap your own plan. You can have some goals. Oh God, I'm going to plop my way around over here. Now I'm going to plop my way back over here. Do you know God says this? He already has a plan. Pastor Jerry, are you going to get into that predestination stuff? Maybe. He already has a plan for you. It's a good plan. It's a right plan. So what do I got to do? All I got to do is not try to go out and make another plan. I got to just pray, God. You said the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. All I have to do, God, is seek your will, your plan, your way, and you will lead and guide me into all truth. Woo, man. Stop fighting against God's order. Come under subjection to God's order. You might find out. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Look what I've been hindering. Father, we thank you so much for every person in this place. Thank you for what you do. We thank you for what you have led us into. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the saints. We thank you for leadership, order. Because God, if we didn't have order, we would just be a mess. God, I thank you for vision because without a vision, people fall to pieces. I thank you for a revelation of who you are and what you're about. And God, this morning, I just want to surrender it all to you. My way my will, my wants, my desires, and give it all to you, Lord. Father, I pray touch every person in this room that you would minister their hearts and minds, that their hearts and minds would agree to submit to you, God, with everything that's within them, to do what you say, not what they want to do. Father, in the name of Jesus, touch every heart and mind. As they, are, as they sing us out, if you need prayer this morning, if you have not asked Jesus into your heart, I want you to know that Jesus is here. If the Holy Spirit is convicting you and drawing you, turn and follow him. Turn and follow him. If you're in this place and you need a touch from God, always, the altar's always open. Come and someone will minister to you and pray for you. Our pastors and Sing this as the Holy Spirit touches you. Move out. I see you there hanging on a tree. You bled and then you died and then you rose again for me. Now you are sitting on your heavenly throne. Soon we will be coming home.
Come on.